spoiler alert, when this podcast talks about the books, it talks about it in the context of the entire The Song of Ice and Fire series. And when it does so about the television shows, it does so in the context of the most recent episode. You've been warned. Before the Dragon, a podcast dedicated to George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire and the HBO Game of Thrones prequels franchise. And welcome back to another episode of Before the Dragon podcast. We are in our fifth week of reading the book Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin. It's part of the A Song of Ice and Fire saga. It's one of the supplementary books, so to speak, not one of the main series books that we keep clamoring for Winds of Winter, but we'll see if we get that anytime soon. In the meantime, we still have this one to finish up, and this time around, we're be- this week, we will be looking at Chapter 17, The Dying of Dragons, Rhaenyra Overthrown, The Dying of Dragons, The Short Sad Reign of Aegon II, and the 19th chapter, Aftermath, The Hour of the Wolf. Oh! Cregan. Oh, uh, anyway, since we have two sirens and my neck hurts a little bit, I'm only going to turn to the right to look at each of them. Well, first of all, the sirens are always right here. I'm the one that's wrong. The sirens are right, so they have to look to my right to talk to them. So when I face my chair south, I will turn to my right so that I can see Kelly, the Siren of Ice and Fire from the West. How are you? <laughs> I am excellent and even more impressed with your navigational skills, Matt. <laughs> and we do have another siren that I have to look to my right to. So that means that I have to change my direction of my chair. I have to face my chair north so that I can look to my right and see the Siren of Ice and Fire to the east and that would be Susan. Susan, how are you? I'm fine, Matt. Am I, am I really north of you? No. No, you're not the north. I just have to face north so that you are on oh, my right. Okay. Because the sirens are always right. I think. <laughs> so fancy with his directions. <laughs> Folks, if you have any kind of feedback for us regarding any of these chapters that we've read in the past or are reading this week, feel free to submit them. You can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or you can also tweet to at the letter B, the number four, the Dragon Pod on Twitter. That's the handle that you find. I know all of those things are complicated. Let me make it easy for you. Just remember this one website, mattsaudioblog.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com. There's a contact form there. All you do is just fill out the contact form and hit send. You don't have to know any addresses. You don't have to type anything other than your message. How handy is that? You can also find our Symphony of Ice and Fire panel from Con of Thrones 2019 while you're there in one of the tabs as well. And I encourage you to listen to it there because that's the only place that you can listen to it. It's at the website. It's not on the feed. In the meantime, let's get into talking about these chapters. Uh, Susan, any general thoughts about your read so far before we get started? Oh, dear. Uh, Well, this is the first time that I'm discussing a chapter with you that has to that takes place during the Dance of the Dragons. And uh, it is definitely, I think, you know, some of the most complex, (laughs) complicated chapters that uh, that we have in this. There's just so many things going on, though. I guess I I tried to look at this first chapter as kind of like three big events, but just uh, a lot going on in this first chapter, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, do, do you find it frustrating that George makes these kinds of things so complicated, or do you find it invigorating? Challenging. I find it challenging. <laughs> okay. I, I enjoy I enjoy history, and I like, I mean, like, I, I can, in, in my mind, I can go through the, the lineage of all of the Targaryen kings, and I've got it all in place in my mind. It's just when you start going out to some of these other families and the different people, the different generations there that uh, it it gets to be an awful lot that uh, I just haven't really assimilated it, especially because it's not as like reading the the stories where you, where you've just read those chapters and gotten into those in such depth that you know, those characters so well. 
All right. Well, Susan, first of all, congratulations, because I've yet to even be able to keep track of just the Targaryen lineage throughout the course of this whole reading. Um, so you've got me there already. The, the, the rest of it is overwhelming. Now, Kelly, on the other hand, as I look to the south and turn to my right, I <laughs> see Kelly out there in the west and she's smiling and grinning because she's been with me along this whole Dance of the Dragons ride, uh, as Gildane prefers to call it, the dying of dragons. You've been with me on all of these chapters thus far. Are you giggling because you've got your spreadsheet in front of you and I don't? <laughs> I, I have plentiful notes, uh, very few spreadsheetable information here. Like I give credit to anybody who can keep track of all of this linearly. It is it is a, a tangle, and it, I think a challenge is a good way to put it because it's it is like a mental exercise to keep up with this whole story. And I am just in awe whenever a character pops up that's at all relevant somewhere else, and I'm like. George knew that that character was this little bit part here and this little bit part there and kept track of it in his own mind and has probably a backstory for that little character <laughs> that plays into this in a very nuanced way. Like I just, each of these characters, even though we only get a little bit of a taste of them, I guess maybe because the world is so fleshed out, feels fleshed out to me. So mm. I, I can't put it in spreadsheet. It's all a feeling. <laughs> yeah, so... The fact – I would think that there's just the mere fact that you can't put it all onto a spreadsheet uh, would make you say, enough already. Let's move on. Yeah, man. Let's move on. All right. Well, <laughs> we will move on to this last really uh, – well, I guess the second to the last of The Dying of the Dragons. We move on to Chapter 17, The Dying of Dragons, Rhaenyra Overthrown. Chapter 17, The Dying of Dragons, Rhaenyra Overthrown. Susan, it's been a while since you've been with us. Why don't we let you start wherever you want to? Folks, we don't do point-by-point point chronology through the, the chapter. We're not nearly that organized. Well, I'm not nearly that organized. I won't speak for everybody here. I know some people here are more organized than me. But I just try to pick out what's important to me. So, Susan, what's important to you? Well, as I said, I, one of my concerns to come and discuss this this week was because I hadn't gone into the other chapters in the dance in in this detail and then coming to this one I was afraid that maybe I would be getting into the middle of the story and there would be things going on with characters that I wouldn't understand because I didn't hadn't paid so much attention to the previous chapters but I think I got a pretty good handle on it I, I sort of divided this up into like I say into three big chunks of what's going on here we have the siege of King's Landing with all this crazy stuff that's going on there and, you know, with the dragons and everything get, being overthrown so that Rhaenyra has to leave. We have that big battle at Tumbleton. And then we have the whole issue resolving with Rhaenyra and Aegon II on Dragonstone. So kind of divided it up and tried to look at it that way. And I will have to say that, you know, of the various Targaryens, I wouldn't think that either Rhaenyra or Aegon II were very pleasant Targaryens, either one of them. And as this chapter starts out, Rhaenyra is definitely devolving into paranoia and lashing out at people that she should be looking at as her allies and turning people into enemies that she probably didn't have to if she had been a little bit more clever <laughs> about the situation sure i mean we have Corley's the sea snake he's been jailed um his now named son adam has flown off with sea smoke two i guess valerian men that try to free Corliss, they end up getting caught and hung mm -hmm. and all of this kind of culminates to me which is a, a very sad thing is the death of Helena, where she throws herself from the towers. And, and I want to read this quote here. Mushroom asserts that Helena was with child after her days and nights of being sold for a common whore. But this explanation is only as credible as his tale of the brothel queens, which is to say not credible at all. Grand Maester Munkin believes the horror of seeing Sir Theron and Sir Denys die drove her to the act. But if the young queen knew the two men, it would only have been as her jailers, and there is no evidence that she was a witness to their hanging. 
Septon Eustace suggests that Lady Missaria, the white worm, chose this night to tell Helena of the death of her son Maelor and the grisly manner of his passing, though what motive she would have had for doing so beyond simple malice is hard to fathom. Uh, and then the common t- tale told in the streets, and I'm just paraphrasing here, was that Queen Rhaenyra had had Helena th- killed uh, by Luther Larger, just thrown out the window uh, herself. Um, but the thing that I also find very interesting is this connection with the dragon, um, Dreamfire, mm-hmm. because uh-huh. uh, from from again from the text at the moment of her at the moment of her death across the city atop the hill of Rhaenys, her dragon Dreamfire rose suddenly with a roar that shook the dragon pit, snapping two of the chains that bound her. When Dowager Queen Alicent was informed of her daughter's passing, she rent her garments and pronounced a dire curse upon her rival. Um, there's a lot of things that maybe say that Rhaenyra's got it coming, of course, uh, but the, the connection to the dragon was uh, real important to me for that. Yeah, and, and, and with all those various um, thoughts about what had been the, the motivation for Helena to uh, to kill herself if that's if she wasn't murdered. Uh, is there one of those over another that you thought? I mean, for me, I really wasn't, and, and I didn't. I didn't know if maybe that brothel queen's part was something that did come from a previous chapter. I wasn't quite sure what they were referring to there, but uh, the rest of it, I didn't really see one situation over another that was more credible than the other. So I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know what to cut, make of it. Uh, it's a good question. Kelly, what do you think? Well, yeah, the, you were right. The, the brothel queen's part was from another section. And also, this makes me want to ask, Susan, Have you did you read The Princess and the Queen before this? I did. It's been a while, but yes. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Just because uh, this whole uh, brothel queen's thing, I think, was new in Fire and Blood as well. So even if it didn't seem familiar from reading as you were going through it the first time, it's because it wasn't even in Princess and the Queen, so... I found that interesting that this little mushroom tail is is added material for some reason. So it kind of stands out for two two reasons that way. But yeah, I think it was the Septon Eustace story that the uh, the white worm told her how Mailer had died bec- only because that story was also not in the original. How mm. uh, on on the that bridge bitter bridge uh, death of the boy that was new. So both of these being kind of new kind of tied those together in my mind as being the likely uh, reason for, in this case as to why Helena killed herself. It kind of added backstory reason and then the reason here explained, you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I was familiar with what had happened to her son. I remembered that part of the story. So, and certainly if she had heard that from anyone, and already with that, what had already happened to her other children, I can certainly see that being motivation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the brothel queen part, I think, was the new part um, as well. So there's a lot of new stuff here, too, I suppose. So maybe my logic isn't sound. <laughs> uh, but um, Matt, did you say you thought which one you thought it was? I didn't. Uh, I, I'm tending to lean myself towards the fact that the white worm, Lady Miseria, might have done that. I'm just going to call her Lady Misery, guys. I can't say that <laughs> name, Miseria, mm-hmm. Miseria, all the time. Uh, the Lady Misery pretty much told her, and I, I could see Lady Miseria being quite capable of malice. I don't know why right. uh, Munkin would dismiss that. Or mushroom would dismiss that, or Munkin, or Gildane, or uh, anything. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think Gildane might have just been presenting the mushroom uh, options here, just that there is an opportunity for us to dismiss a mushroom story <laughs> for once. <laughs> true enough. Yeah, and then the the, the 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 small folk always seem to know, don't they? Uh, <laughs> you know, the whole thing that maybe she Queen Rhaenyra just had her thrown from from the tower. Although, why keep her alive that long if you were going to do that? So, uh, that I kind of throw in that one out. But the, the small folk like to t- tell their own tales. I think the possibility that she was just trying to get rid of another dragon rider at that point and m- get a different rider for that dragon, I don't know why that wasn't presented as a, you know, reasoning. It, it's not, you know, my favorite option, but I could see the logic in it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. 
I liked your your pointing out about Dreamfire uh, and this connection to to the writer at that moment, and maybe that's what stood out in my mind is that now you've got this dragon that's available for a new writer, although sadly not for long. <laughs> but this uh, this is kind of the impetus, like this the igniter for the riots that are about to start here. So I think whether or not it's like the most horrible thing that happened and then the riots started, or if this causes the riots, and it's just kind of you know, causation versus association or something like that. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it definitely sets it off this night. And it's kind of presented by Gildane as this caused it. Um, so whether or not the small folk were right or wrong in believing in Renera, that Renera did this, the fact that they thought so little of her at this point, I think, is telling that it was coming either way. Yeah, well, and uh, let's not forget that the shepherd's been pointing up the hill towards the dragon pit for a while now. Um, he, he was already <laughs> starting to allude to that the first time we ever hear f- of him, which is uh, uh, quite a bit of time before this happens, at least a couple weeks. And now he's got like 10,000 people listening to him. I mean, this guy is the TV evangelist for, of, of, of king of them all. He should be considered one of the three kings that we call them in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, moon of madness. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, they just the the city watcher sent to try and quell them, and man, they just get slaughtered in, in in a way that's not cool at all. Yeah, and it's it's kind of awkwardly like timely that we're reading this right now, and all of the protests going on around the world. I kind of feel like there's a bit of mob mentality that can happen whenever there's this much fear or dis, you know injustice happening, and w- who the people look to for a leader is very consequential. Like you have, you know, if, if the leader is um, preaching this madness, then yeah, there, a lot of people are going to end up dying. Yeah. And certainly, you know, as, as they said, the, just, just the sheer numbers of people who went up against the you know, King's guard, even though you had armed men in, in these, not, or not King's guard, the gold cloaks, the city watch. Even though these men were armed in their various ways, it's almost like that uh, later on thing that Mushroom says about rats taking down a bear. I mean, when you have so many against, uh, you know, such a smaller group, they're going to get overwhelmed. Well, it's just we've been mentioning the 10,000 crowd that it just it's just a nitpick and I'm stupid about numbers. But the text says that from 10,000 throats, a cry went up, kill them, kill them. And like some vast beast with 10,000 legs, the lambs began to move. Now, that would be 20,000 legs. Yes, it would. It was so bothersome. <laughs> it's like, well, did half of them leave? Is that what I'm supposed to take from this? It was very confusing. So I just I wanted in case anyone else noticed that and, and was confused. I'm, I'm with you. My math peeps. I'm with you. <laughs> All right. Matt's tomatoes reign here this week on <laughs> our reading of Fire and Blood. In case you don't know what Matt's tomatoes are, folks. Back when Lost was airing and I was doing a podcast on Lost, I continually asked my guest hosts and my guests on the podcast, where did they get the tomatoes? Where did the guy, where did, where did our Losties get the tomatoes? It made no sense to me whatsoever. Um, so, and did it matter? <laughs> no, not one bit. Did tomatoes figure into the end of the story? No, not at all. So 10,000 legs, 20,000 legs. Five legs. I don't care what. <laughs> it was just does. in Congress, it's a, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, it it was a massive throng. That's all we need to know. But if you're obsessed with numbers like me and a few a few of our other friends that we might know from podcasts, then you might read have read that and been like, "But wait, what about the other ten thousand legs?" And it would <laughs> stump you. <laughs> DJ Tim Hines. This podcast <laughs> is dedicated to you. That's right. <laughs> I noticed one line in here when they started talking about the riots and so forth that stood out to me, where it said, Gutter knights, mummer kings, and mad prophets rule the streets. And the reason that that stuck out to me was the mummer kings and mad prophets. We've got the idea with the House of the Undying and with what's going on with uh, Fagon in the main series, that he may be the mummer king of the prophecy. And it's very likely that he's going to be aligning himself with the faith when he gets to King's Landing. And so I have no idea that this has any kind of connection that George was trying to allude to anything here. It's just 
that little phrase stuck out to me and made me think, ah, yeah, Mummer Kings and Mad Prophets. That's interesting because we have seen so many instances just in this reading alone, I mean, not this particular week, but in the reading of this book, where history has repeated itself or certain prophecies have come to light. Kelly and I discovered one just last week about Hugh the Hammer and a prophecy that was going on around him uh, and how it related to Robert actually taking down the Targaryens. So Mm. there's not just prophecies, but also just a, a cyclic repeat of history, especially in the first few chapters. I've, I found a lot of that. And I like the fact that you're using this um, to speculate as to where the story may go, because we may see, again, some types of history repeating itself in another way or form in the future of our main story. I like that. Right, right. I was, I've heard a lot of people speculate that they think that, that when Fagon gets to King's Landing, that he'll He'll line himself with the faith because that'll help him with his legitimacy and so forth. And, of course, the faith is at counter odds with uh, the Lannisters and everything. So I don't know. But there you go. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I I was just thinking, though, that just to be antagonistic here, (laughs) that I think sometimes there's a – the more you hear of situations in which a prophecy could apply a little bit more, del- you could take the prophecy to be a little bit less accurate or a little bit more diluted in its importance because it can apply to multiple situations. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Us- using the cycles of history, though, and George's tendency to use them, I think that that's a good, pretty good template to make some predictions on, because at least then you have some physical evidence yeah. and a little bit of speculation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it more as a narrative device than as I was trying to present it as, but I thought it was kind of a funny <laughs> downplay on, on George's prophecies, meaning nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well, one more thing with the shepherd that I just want to mention, and, and this I think it's kind of takes place towards the end of the chapter with his preaching when he when they start talking about this. But I was noting how he's constantly, you know, he's talking about how the wealthy uh, are damned and, you know, the high lords and everything that, you know, to have wealth is is not a good thing. And in some ways that that parallels with, you know, real world religions and what several real world religions say about wealth. but in the case of the shepherd, then he's he's inciting violence as a means to to uh, deal with the situation, which is very much at odds with the way that I think most real world religions w- that preached, you know, peace and uh, against uh, wealth and uh, sure enough. so forth. So anyway, sure enough. On the other hand, in in our own story, whether you want to look at either feast or you want to look at uh, or feast or dance, or you want to look at the television show, we here have this high sparrow who uses force from time to time. True. But always is encouraging people to, you know, strip themselves of their wealth. Right, right. Yeah, and this guy is too. I'm just saying that, you know, like uh, most of the time with, like, with your Buddhas and Christ and so so forth, that they would be more... Or Muslim or any religion, really. Yeah, they, yeah, that it would be more of a... A peace-loving thing, yes. yeah, not using yes. force. Right. Yeah. yeah, I feel like the, he at, at this point he's in, telling them to kill the dragons. Am I misremembering, or is he? Are they inside? I mean, they're uh, no, you, no. You're right, but at the, after the dragons are dead, he needs a new cause to take up, and so he continues on with saying, you know, get the the lords and and the people of wealth need to give up their wealth and. And everybody needs to be poor and all this stuff. He does continue on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, but beyond that. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and, and it kind of loses, its, it, it's kind of like what I love about this is we go through the course of all of these chapters and, and not to spoil anything in the future, but it's kind of like for the shepherd, it was like the seven came to him and says, you have one job. <laughs> Get rid of the dragons. You have just one job. We don't need you after that, Mr. Shepherd. Right. For sure. Yeah, because he does kind of just go away after this, you know, plot device here. But he could also, I think, go looking ahead to like the High Sparrow you were talking about. I wonder if so the whole shepherd thing was added in Fire and Blood. It wasn't in the Princess and the Queen very much at all. If, if he, I don't even know if the shepherd was mentioned. I think he was, it was just considered like the mob. Don't quote me on that, but it's, <laughs> but so he, his part. Well, you said it. Now I got to go look and cut it out. You're so fired. <laughs> Definitely fired. That's fine. (laughs) 
I've, I've earned it at this point. But he was definitely expanded on in this in this book. Um, so I wonder if his story was made so much more kind of seemingly like the instigator of, of all of this uprising and then how at the, at the end uh, he does end up having like no followers. If this is going to be referenced at all in the future books when the Sp- High Sparrows kind of story plays out if it does play out at all like it did in the show, if this will be like referenced somehow. And now we'll have a little bit of backstory <laughs> into what they're talking about when they mention it. <laughs> yeah, if it goes anything like in the show, uh, then there, there won't be anybody left anyway. So yeah, nobody left to follow, nobody left to follow the the leader. Yeah, I could just picture like Cersei taking it, this force uh, that it's coming against her and, and dealing with it, mentioning something offhand about the shepherd of old or the shepherd during the dance and how the, you know, how big of a threat he was then and what he managed to do. Now we, we can't let that happen again. Or, you know, after the masses had their fill of blood with, you know, following the shepherd, they all abandoned him, you know, somehow referencing what happened here like that. Here we go. Love it. Um, uh, what else have we got on this chapter? Susan, where do you want to go next? Well, yeah, then you had uh, Rhaenyra finding out about what had happened with her husband, Damon, and, and Nettles. I mean, again, here's a situation where this is kind of of her own making because she had you know, tried to, to get the girl killed. So she's starting to hear about the fate of all these people, and she's trying to implore additional assistance from other allies that are further away to send her men, but... They can't really because of the, the situation with the weather. It's going to take a long time. So you know, things start to become desperate. Do, do we want to talk about the young men who are being put forward as kings here in the city? Before we do that, let's just uh, pour one out for the people who were near her that tried to help her. Like the seven who rode out were Sir Merrick Manderley, heir to White Harbor, <laughs> Sir Loreth Lansdale, and Sir Harold Duke. Knights of the Queen's Guard, Sir Harmon of the Reeds, called the Ironbanger, Sir Giles Ironwood, an exiled knight from Dorne, and Sir William Royce, armed with the famed Valerian sword Lamentation, mm. and Sir Glendon Good, <laughs> Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard, and I'll just add for a day because that's <laughs> uh, so they're they're sent out to try and take care of these masses and everything. I uh, wanted to add that that Glendon Good reminded me of Glendon Ball from the Duncan Egg stories. If we remember him, and just the name sounded so similar. His father had been uh, promised to become the Lord Command or or one of the King's Guards, and then when Aegon the Unworthy died, his Heir Darren didn't uh, live up to that, so that was one reason why he went into rebellion with uh, with the Blackfires. So here, you, here you have a, a Glendon Good, a Glendon who uh, who is part of the King's Guard and just for Lord Commander for a day. So uh, <laughs> I just again, George uses all these similar names, and I know there's probably no, no connection at all between that, but the one reminded me of the other again. But yes, we get to these guys here. This poor Tristan, Tristan who became Tristan Truefire. I mean, this poor boy, uh, this Sir Perkin the Flea that decides that uh, he's going to raise him up to king and claims that he's the son of uh, the old king, um, Viserys, I believe. He's a bastard of his, I guess what he's claiming so i I just feel like uh as we get in this kid's story he just gets totally well yeah to me they're all puppets uh him and uh is it garon pale hair yeah gaiman yeah yeah gaiman pardon me gaiman pale hair yeah uh to me they're you know this this flea dude uh is using tristain these uh gaiman's mother and her paramour are using gaiman um, I do find some interesting things coming out of it, though. Um, yeah. Do we want to go into that? Right. Uh, I, this, this is going ahead a little bit too, but just the the difference between the two is is that the that the one guy eventually ends up losing his life, where the other one probably gets elevated to a position more for the short life that he has that's much higher than he would have ever expected. Uh, Gaiman, mm-hmm. you know. So, anyway. Uh, when you're talking about the interesting things that came out of that, are you you're talking about all those decrees? Yes. It's interesting how that was uh, it was kind of 
phrased or put forward like, oh, all this crazy stuff that they were coming up with. And it was, you know, all things that we would look at and think, well, gosh, that sounds pretty darn reasonable, you know, <laughs> that yeah. uh, we're going to take take care of wounded men who fought for us. And when there's a famine that we're going to try and help the poor with uh, bread and beer and, you know. Yeah, I've got the quote right here. One decree after another came down from the House of Kisses, is what his court was called, uh, where the child kings had his seat. Each one more outrageous, according to Gildane, uh, than the last. Gaiman decreed that girls should henceforth be equal with boys in matters of inheritance, that the poor be given bread and beer in times of famine, that men who lost limbs in war must afterwards be fed and housed by whichever lord they had been fighting for when they, the loss took place. Gaiman decreed that husbands who beat their wives should themselves be beaten, irrespective of what the wives had done to warrant such chastisement. These edicts were almost certainly the work of the Dornish whore named Sylvana Sand, reputedly the paramour of the little king's mother Essie, if mushroom is to believe, be believed. Um, but still, just the phrasing of that, and it, it, I mean, where is it again? Um, each one more outrageous than the last. That's, <laughs> That's just like infuriating to me. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course it would be somebody with a Dornish name that would come up with these things with more quality to them. Oh, of course. Yeah, especially when you look at the way that we, we see throughout the whole saga here, you know, how the Dornish are way more in touch with our world than any of the other realms. Right. <laughs> Shout out to Stephanie for uh, the progressiveness that uh, we're seeing here. <laughs> we, we got a lot of that with uh, uh, with good Queen Alice saying we got a little bit more here, but alas, it was not to last. <laughs> I did enjoy that there were these three kings kind of brought up. Um, we, we do start seeing them here before the dragon pit, and then they, they have more time in the sun after the dragon pit. But uh, the, the whole Varys riddle where power resides where men believes it resides kind of comes into play uh i think after the madness has left everyone which you know if we don't want to talk about the dragon pits we don't have to talk about the dragon pit i'm just i'm willing to move on <laughs> i don't want to talk about that part uh, i feel like we have to talk <laughs> yeah, about the dragon pit <laughs> oh so sad <laughs> Well, we're talking about these decrees, though. I think that it's also interesting that you had the Tristan Truefires, uh, the ones that the, the things that were coming out from his court were certainly more self-serving of those people because they were dividing up the coin from the treasury and forgiving debts to, I guess, to each other and raising up people to uh, nobility and giving out hunting rights to the king's wood. I guess that was... That one was a little bit more smaller folks, I guess. That was to try to, to uh, I guess, appeal to them a little bit, get them on his side. But, you know, these were obviously things that were self-serving to his followers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He, it, it, it seemed very self-serving. The impression that I got, not said in so many words, but that's definitely the impression that I got. Yeah, and I think their their positions even can tell you why they were banking the decrees they were making. You had the women who were kind of raising up this boy who were on Visenya's Hill, still just not in a castle. Uh, granted, they're probably in like well off <laughs> from where they were before, but they were um, they're still in the streets. Whereas you have Tristane Truefire and and Sir Perkin like up in the Red Keep, like they're in the castle now. They want to be the lords. Granted, they're going to repeal all the taxes because, you know, they don't foresee the need for them right now. Everything around them is gold and pretty and way more lush than anything they've ever experienced. So they seem fine off. <laughs> at the, you know, they're very short sighted at this point and they're just reveling. Uh, it's kind of how I took it. But when you've got Gaiman's court still in the street, you know, they're going to be a lot more egalitarian with their uh, philosophies, I think. <laughs> keep from getting run over yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh we do have to talk about the dragon pit now because this is where the shepherd uh the alleged third queen king even though he never claimed to be a king uh that's where he sets his roost on rainy's hill but we got to figure out how he gets there first um 
10,000, 20,000, doesn't matter how many <laughs> legs you want to count. Uh, let's go, Kelly. Let's let's talk about this. All right. Yep. The, uh, there is a madness in the blood. Everybody gets right on board with this plan. And it, it took as many men as it took to get to the dragon pit and to take down four of the Targaryen dragons being housed there. And I'll bet you at that point, you're starting to realize why it's a bad idea to uh, keep all of your weapons in one arsenal. <laughs> like, <laughs> it makes it really easy to disarm you at this point. But man, it, they don't go down easy. I, I was impressed to hear about like how many hundreds actually ki were killed. But I mean, at this point, I'm rooting for the dragons, you know, like they're chained up. They're not defenseless, but, you know, they're, they're, it's unfair. <laughs> Yeah. Now, Taraxis was the one that I felt worst for because it got, he kind of got forced back into his little cave there. And then the shepherd said, Hey, there's a back door, right? I thought that was comedic. Like it, the comedy of that moment was almost enough to make me overlook the fact that a, a you know, beautiful, gorgeous dragon was just killed. But are you kidding me? Come I was on. Like, I was like, Oh, come on. Oh, it was funny. There's always uh, yeah, a back but door. <laughs> That was good. That one, that one, I, I appreciated the satire there. <laughs> oh. But yeah, that was cruel. Um, and I think it highlighted how cruel it was. Like he wasn't, he was just trying to, you know, hide. And yeah, they still got taken down. The little baby hatchlings, mm. Shrikos and Morgul. Those were, yeah, the, the twins yeah. dragons who they never flew were taken down. Um, do you have anything thoughts on 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 the killers? Because it all seems speculative. But did you guys have any thoughts on those dragon slayers? Well, I'm there. There's too many hues <laughs> in this damn story, so I, I want to eliminate <laughs> that one immediately. Have the I mean, you had fifty dragon keepers overwhelmed and slaughtered at first, too. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Um, yeah. That was impressive, too, to hear about. Like, we don't really hear much about these dragon keepers, but that would be the crew I'd want to hang out with. Like, they've got stories, you know? Whenever a new Targaryen was going to the dragon pit to pick out a new dragon, like, they always had opinions about which one would be better. <laughs> these guys, yeah, got all taken out. And you know what? Pour one out for these guys, too. Like, fall, you know, when you are the keeper of an animal and you go down protecting it, like, you've got my eternal respect. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, mine too. And 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 Dreamfire. Now that one was the most mature of the dragons that was there. I mean, this dragon had been the one that was ridden by uh, is it Reina, Princess Reina at first, uh, before Helena. Yeah, and then Helena, uh -huh. and then Helena's uh -huh. dragon after uh, that. And yep. It sounded like a beautiful animal, and and then it sounds like you know, poor thing was being slaughtered. You know, it was attacking, but it was hit with arrows on all sides, and finally blew up and brought the roof down on everybody. Yeah, like she was ex actually trying to escape, which you would think yeah, it kind of kind of Yeah, like in in comparison to what we see later with uh Cyrax it was kind of interesting. So that'll be interesting to kind of talk about the the, the two dis differences because yeah, here Dreamfire is definitely trying to get away. And speaking of maturity, I've got my, my spreadsheet out. So uh, Dreamfire mm -hmm. is uh, 107 about years old when she died um, in the, here in mm -hmm. the Dragon Pit. So over a century, uh, if, uh, if she was hatched somewhere between 8 AC and 32 AC on Dragonstone. So it's a bit of a, you know, somewhere around a century is how old this one is. I guess Verimathor and Silverwing would have been the two other biggest dragons at this yeah, point yeah those Were are the next in the, like generationally like you kind of got Balerion, vagar and meraxes in the first generation and then you've got quicksilver who died and then vermithor and Silverwing are just right up there um right above dreamfire so so it's not unplausible that a dragon that's 107 years old would have enough power to bring the whole roof down i guess uh yeah and especially it said it was already uh weakened by the all of the dragon flame that had been <laughs> Going off, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. For comparison, Taraxes, the other dragon that was in there, was the next largest, and that one was about 12 years, or um, I'm sorry, he was born after Joffrey, because this is Joffrey's dragon, and Joffrey, they all had eggs put into their cradles, so he was born after Joffrey mm -hmm. uh, was born, so 117 AC, uh, this is 
13 years later, <laughs> it's a baby dragon still, you know, these are all still, the rest of these are so, so much babies in comparison. Right. And it still took that many people and they yep. still killed that mm-hmm. many people. Even those hatchlings. Yeah. Those hatchlings yeah. killed dozens, it said, you know. <laughs> Right, and then you come out to Cyrax. Yeah, and here is uh, Mushroom, of course, won't take credit for this. He he, he saw Joffrey leave. Uh-huh. He didn't tell anybody. <laughs> um, Mushroom, the hero, who knows everything. <laughs> he had been uh, commanded he, he to hold his tongue, Matt. <laughs> well, he is being loyal in, in that respect. <laughs> Um, or BDS, he could have, anyways. He could, have, he could have physically held his tongue and said, there goes Joffrey. <laughs> oh, he heeds the spirit of his lady's orders, Matt. <laughs> okay. um, all right. Well, she, he is he is her greatest counselor, if you ask him. So he'd <laughs> rather be her lover. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sad. Yeah. Joffrey, you know, it's like... <laughs> Dude, your your dragon is over there in the pit. You don't jump on somebody else's dragon. It, it's kind of like it's one of those golden rules, isn't it? Yeah, we we yeah. have this this example of what happens. We don't really have any other examples of this. The dragon seeds are kind of the closest you get, but none of the the riders ever well, got close to riding the, a dragon that wasn't theirs. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, there were many many attempts by other people for for. Did ride those before Sir Hugh and and Sir, and Sir Ulf were found, right? Yeah, all the stories. Were and and they, they were got. riding, and they were riding dragons that that had been ridden multiple by multiple riders already. Mm-hmm. So this is Cyrax's. Is this Cyrax's first rider? Non. Uh, well, outside of outside of Rhaenyra. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, since you've got the spreadsheet, there wasn't Cyrax mm-hmm. born on Dragonstone. Yeah, yeah, she was yeah. uh at seven. Rhaenyra took Cyrax, um, uh-huh. and hmm, it was said it was hatched right around uh, ninety seven AC. Um, How old is Rhaenyra? Oh, she was born in ninety seven, so the dragon was probably hatched around then, and then became around seven years. I just assumed that most of these dragons were hatched uh, after. Uh, the Dreamfire um, writer. Oh, what was her name? Um, Raina. Yeah, Raina. Thank you. Raina was putting dr- uh, dragon eggs in with the uh, with the babies. I kind of that was a um, ongoing uh, tradition. But yeah, and that's that's where that's where Sunfire, Dreamfire, mm-hmm. and other ones came from. Right? Especially uh, Vermithor and Silverwing were specifically mentioned that she put those in her her. Jaharis and Alisane's cribs. Right, right, right. And you would think, but uh, it seemed like from what I got from uh, this Renera's dragon, Cerax, it didn't sound like that one was given to her in the cradle. It sounded like she you know, took that dragon who was already on Dragonstone. Or, this, the know, quote is that at seven, she, at seven, she became a dragon rider, taking to the sky on the young dragon she named Cyrax after the goddess of old Valyria. So she named it. All right. So All right. it's hard to say whether she named it because yeah. it she hatched it or she just picked one and then named it. But okay. either way, it's a young dragon. Um, she and which she named. So I would think it she is its first rider, Matt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So she is his first rider, or mm-hmm. Cyrex's first rider, and Joffrey is an unwanted passenger. And, right. Uh, it's tragic. He falls to the streets. Um, Bad things are done to his body. The one thing that we have here is, and Susan Kelly and I last week explored a lot of the fact that a lot of these riders for the blacks, their body was seemingly never recovered. Joffrey is not that case. Uh, as far as Jaceres, Lucaris, um, or Lucaris, um, and uh, Damon. Uh, did none of none of their bodies uh, possibly Rainey's who they think that her body burned and it was there but they weren't sure right. if, so this is the first uh writer for the blacks mm-hmm. where we definitively have a body recovered huh that's interesting uh, i was thinking too when we were talking about uh this with cyrax throwing him do 
have we read anything about any of the Targaryens that tried to that like when they were trying to uh bond with the dragon, become a dragon rider, that they were uh unsuccessful, that they didn't weren't able to accomplish that. I don't remember reading that with any of the the you know, the ones in the royal line. I, I can't recall. The, no, not in this book so far. I think there's one where like later on where the dragon uh it comes out malformed or something and, and bites the girl, but that's like the closest I could say. Yeah. Yeah, some of them um uh, some of the Targaryens, even during this time where there were dragons, didn't seem to become dragon riders. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember any of them that, you know, like we had the dragon seeds that some people attempted and weren't successful or were burned or whatever. I don't think I heard, I've seen that with any of the Targaryens. Yeah, and I, I wonder if that's because it's considered so um, symbolic for a Targaryen to bond with a, a dragon, and if there were to be a situation in which a Targaryen was rejected from a dragon, it would be very, I don't, I, I would imagine, kind of scandalous or something. So maybe it's not written down, um, or it's not you know kept track of or, or talked about um, because of its dangerous symbolic nature that way. Um, mm -hmm. so maybe it does happen. We just don't read about it is the closest right. reasoning yeah. I can uh, say. <laughs> another pointing to the exceptionalism thing going on, uh, where maybe, uh, maesters who are writing these histories, again, they have their own slant, uh, a Gildane or a Munkin may very well be doing their best to protect the Targaryen name, regardless of which side the greens or the blacks they're on or, uh, any time prior to that. Yeah, but yeah, here it is. Uh, a very clear what happens when a, a dragon is mounted by not its rider, and I think this is also a good example because you could it kind of explained how she wasn't bothered by him rustling her chains because he was a familiar smell. But so this is probably another case in which a drag or a, an attempted riding undertaken by somebody who the dragon wouldn't have minded being near it in the first place. So it's these like unfortunate circumstances that combine to sh give us this play out of uh, what happens when a, a dragger is mounted by not its rider. What else on the dragon pit? Anything? Well, I guess we should talk about what Cyrex does. Let's let's go to that. <laughs> not happy about it. Uh, twisting all over the place, bucks this kid off uh, two hundred feet above the ground, um, but then goes on a rampage. A weird rampage, right? Because it's not like a fire rampage. It's like a tooth and nail and um, ripping and clawing and biting rampage. And she doesn't fly away like Dreamfire. She just mm. goes to town on the town. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it, it, one comment was that, you know, the dragon could have, have rained down drag, dragon fire from above where it would have been out of range of anybody who had would have, you know, be trying to attack it in return. But it, it didn't do that. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I found compelling about this is that, that Syrax was getting revenge for what had happened to his, his brothers and sisters. It's like, you did this, I'm going to take you out. Now, didn't choose the exact, he was so grief stricken that maybe, you know, they weren't thinking about how to do it best, uh -huh. but uh -huh. they were angry. Syrax was angry, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I wrote I, down, I, like, uh, she, uh, for went any uh, range weaponry and went right to melee because she wanted to feel that vengeance and that revenge, you know, on her person, on her, her dragon self. <laughs> you know, that's very much it. like the behavior of rage and, and wanting revenge is to do it with your own bear claws and teeth. So is that her own rage over her dragon kin or is it her tapping into Rhaenyra's rage? Keep in mind that also she has been previously described as having grown uh, lazy um, and often is just kind of like hand fed. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Renera didn't ride her too much. It seemed. Uh, uh, well, one thing that struck me about this was Renera was up on top of the castle watching this happen. And of course, she had little Aegon the Younger with her. And, you know, as he continues to have to be witness to all these horrific scenes. You know, here's, here's another example of that going on here. Uh, and it seems like, you know, by the morning, they slip out of town at dawn because uh, I think at that point they realize, well, town's gone. We're going to be, you know, all these different factions and so forth. The 
with the King's Guard having or the City Watch having been decimated and everything that they just uh, had no way they were going to be able to hold the castle. Absolutely, um, they they have to abandon. Um, those who choose to stay behind it does not really go all that well for them. Um, can anybody figure out why the White Worm didn't leave? No. I mean, I guess maybe King's Landing is where she has influence and she knows it. If she were to leave with Rhaenyra, maybe she knew the fate that befell everybody that went with her. If she is magical. Mm, possibly. Um, I, I found this parallel interesting also because she had kind of become, uh, I guess, the Lady of Whispers, the Mistress of Whispers. In all but name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and e Gild Gildane even calls her that. Nor was the Mistress of Whispers. Lady Myceria of Lys, spared on account of her sex, taken whilst attempting to flee, the white worm was whipped naked through the city from the Red Keep to the Gate of the Gods. If she were still alive by the time she reached the gate, Sir Perkin promised she would be spared and allowed to go. She made it only half the distance, dying on the cobblestones, with hardly a patch of her pale white skin left upon her back. Ah, not a good way. But the thing that I pointed, the thing that struck me, I don't know why I didn't realize that she was from Lys. Because isn't that where Varys is from? Do you have to be from Lys ah. to be a good whisperer's person? Huh. That's, yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I knew that she was, because she's, she's the one who'd been the paramour of uh, Damon. Uh huh. Right, yeah. He didn't try and marry her, but he had a child with her and wanted to give the child a dragon egg. Which, yeah, Viserys did not like that at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, not uh, too dissimilarly, but we also have the uh, the Master of Whispers from um, the Greens side, whose name is Laris. <laughs> So you either have to be from Lise, or <laughs> your name has to be one letter off from Varys <laughs> in pronunciation. <laughs> yes. uh, see, I always called him Larry's. Maybe I, maybe I should start calling Varys Varys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I could not. Yeah, we, you know, there's a theme uh, for the Whisperers, and <laughs> we've we've oh, pinned it down. Def definitely a template here. <laughs> <laughs> and during this during this period of time, he had disappeared, but everybody thought he was still in the city and kind of stirring up a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. Yeah, th I think that's a good theory that he was causing a lot more of the anger against the the blacks at this point than uh, they uh, there otherwise might have been. Maybe he was spreading word of the shepherd or giving the shepherd words to say or. There's even a theory that water was uh, spiked with basilisk blood, which was the poison that um, Jack and Hagar used oh. uh, the dog in Harrenhal that made it eat oh. its master or attack its master. So putting it kind of diluted into the water of the population might increase some of that, I don't know, madness. <laughs> it, but that's, again, it, it's similar to how Varys kind of disappears after uh, Tyrion is. Uh, allowed to escape after he helps in that uh, endeavor and then he kind of disappears and then you know like people think that maybe he had things to do like behind the, the riots that were happening earlier in King's Landing when they were having the, the bread riots where um, mm -hmm. you know that there was a role that he played there so again we're having those kind of echoes here. Yeah. The idea that these um, people who use the masses, like the whisperers, have to have their pulse, you know, their thumb on the pulse of the masses, so then they would also know how to uh, mobilize or weaponize the masses. And then we have the gruesome imagery of the shepherd continuing to preach amongst the dragon heads, mm. the rotting heads that he has um, uh, there in the dragon pit with him. That that that's a really disgusting image. Like I said, the, the seven said he had one job. You have one job, <laughs> Shepard. Get rid of the dragons. We'll take care of the rest. And people just start dropping off from him. He loses his audience. Ke Kelly, does that feed more into your whole Basculus speculation there? Well, because there's <laughs> not, not as much need to have the people rising up now that Rhaenyra's gone. 
Yeah, th- a little bit. I, I, I tend to think that there's it's less likely to be that fanciful because I, I really think that the the mob mentality is a true thing and, and that once you have all of these people, you can direct their anger and their frustration in their life at like a single target. Like they, they'll buy it and, and once it's taken care of and they have to go home and realize that they still have all of their issues, um, there's a bit of what is described here, which is uh, people trying to hide their faces and, and – they don't want to be associated with this action that they partook of. And as his uh, strength is waning, you kind of see everybody looking back towards Aegon's Hill, which is happens to be where Tristane Truefire is. And I think that there's the answer to Varys's riddle that uh, power residing where men believe it resides because, yeah, like we killed the dragons and yet my house is still the, norm- the size it was before. My children who died are still dead and all of the things that I was fighting for are still still here all of my struggles are still day to day and and this did not give me the answers i wanted and now they look to uh, the the red keep which is a, a symbol of power yeah the small folk of the city woke as if from a bad dream septon used this room and like sinners waking cold and sober after a night of drunken debauchery and revelry they turned in shame hiding their faces from one another and hoping to forget <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but it could be that that was the these people wouldn't have gone as far if it hadn't been for poison. So I'm not saying that that disproves it. <laughs> I'm just saying human nature is uh, tends to lend itself to that kind of behavior. I think, uh, and this does sound so real. I think um, I really love George's writing about the, how this plays out. All right. So now we're entering into the moon of madness. Uh, we kind of talked about what everybody's proclaiming and everything that goes on there. Um, we don't get to, I'm, that's pretty much the state that the city stays in for a little while while uh, Rhaenyra is running. Um, but there's still fighting going on. Uh, we have the second battle of Tumbleton. Does anybody want to start to tackle yes, that? Yes, yes. Um I'd like to say that I I think uh, it's interesting that Adam Valerian, he was very uh, upset about being accused of being a traitor, like the two other dragon seeds who become traitors. So he is going to go out of his way to to prove that that he is not a traitor. And it talks about him going to the Green Men on the the Isle of Faces and. It doesn't tell us anything other than that he took counsel there, but it's one of those places of, of such mystery in the stories that we all want to know so much more about. It's like, what happened there? Why did he go there? You know, you want to know a little bit more about that in a, in, in a couple of sentences. I want to know more about those green mm. men. <laughs> no, I'm with you, Susan. Like, that was just such a throwaway line that I was like, but, but. I don't want to hear about all the river lo- rivermen that he he gathered, all the, the near 4,000 river lords. Great, great. You know, like, okay, uh, Sir Elmo has a funny quip about a dragon in one's courtyard does wonders to resolve one's doubts. Hilarious. That's fine. That's but funny. I want to know what happened on the, on the island in the God's Eye. Like, <laughs> what counsel did they give him? What's that all about? Yeah. I know, but unfortunately, yeah, he goes from there to battle and dies. So I guess we'll never know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, as and as he is is doing that and standing on the side of the blacks, you have the uh, Prince Darren with the greens and and his dragon Teresian. Ter- Ter- I don't know how to Tessarian? say that one. Tessarian. Okay. Now he sounds like that prince sounds like of the various ones in that family well, it sounds like he was a fairly decent one anyways but uh, he's stuck there with uh, the two betrayers and we have this Lord Unwin Peak when the Peaks who become such a significant family in the later Blackfire Rebellions and here they are uh, you know being real loyalists for the for the crown at this point in time but they are trying to figure out what are they going to do with these two betrayers and up with this this plot, uh, this uh, bloody Caltrops plot. Where mm, yeah, because the the uh, they just got news that Aemon had died. Aemon One Eye had died at Harrenhal, 
and the betrayers are like, now's our chance, crown us. <laughs> right. like, what? Yeah. <laughs> That's all it took. Hugh Hammer wants a crown, the other one just wants High Tower. Or yeah, yeah, high yeah. yeah, Sir Alf, Sir Alf yeah. wants his High Garden. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but uh, Sir Hugh is is definitely he's it's Sir Hugh the Hammer. He's definitely got his eyes on the big prize. Right when he <laughs> shows up with this black iron crown, uh, which of course sounds like the North, but also the fact that he's a blacksmith, he probably made that with his own two hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and got that going on, and uh, uh, as the men are trying to plot against them and figure out how they're gonna deal with that, that's when. Adam Valerian shows up on Sea Smoke. <laughs> and they take advantage of that, actually. Uh, bold John Roxton kills Sir Hugh. Right. Uh, with yet another Valyrian steel sword here. I was kind of keeping track of Valyrian steel swords mm-hmm. in this particular set of chapters. Uh, here we have Orphan Maker. Yeah. Yeah. Great name. Yeah, and, and it, Orphan Maker actually, uh, 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 Roxton is killed. Mm-hmm. Um, so it ends up in the hands of one of the other Caltrips, doesn't it? Eventually, I didn't keep track of it. I know, like the Lamentation was lost, basically. Lamentations is lost. Right. Um, the reason I'm uh, the reason why I'm keep trying to keep track of these now is because I'm thinking about our our current story, and uh-huh. I'm thinking. You know, uh, we need dragon steel up there against those White Walkers. So, who's where are they at? Right, All right. Okay. It's it's said that it comes into the possession of um, Peak Lord Unwin Peak. So he must have picked uh, it up. Yeah. Ah, uh, maybe another reason why the Peaks become a prominent member in in the modern story. Yeah. Well, uh, you, uh, and I also I like that that way that Roxton, as you said, took advantage of the situation with you, the Hammer, and is like. Oh, uh, you know, I heard you died in battle. You know, he kills him right then. <laughs> and then he's, he, like, promptly slips on uh, the entrails and, and right. is right. killed at that point. So I just, I love that he got, like, a, you know, bamf one-liner in, and then he <laughs> just completely klutzes out. Oh, that's, 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 that's George humor right there. It's very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and then now we get this interesting dragon battle where three dragons of the four that are there end up in this battle but only one of them has a rider right uh it's just adam valerian on sea smoke right the other ones are because right. uh prince darian is killed i want to get uh into those different accounts and see what, who we believe <laughs> um but uh one thing that i love about this was the comparison that uh was made I don't know if this was Munkin's true telling or Gildane's speculation, but uh, that it was considered to be almost if there was an actual dance of dragons, that mm-hmm. uh, that this was the one where it occurred, and it occurred between Tessarian and, and Sea Smoke as they they would dive at each other and circled each other, kind of like a uh, what was called a quote a, like a mating dance. Right, and it makes you wonder because it sounds like they weren't attacking each other. Uh... It wasn't until Vermithor entered the fray that it started getting bloody when he, he uh, bit exactly. the head off of Sea Smoke. So it does make you wonder whether they maybe they weren't actually fighting because, again, the Serion didn't even have a rider. So right. what was he doing? What was his motivation? Some will claim that the bond between a dragon and dragon rider runs so deep that the beast shares his master's loves and hates. But who was the ally here, and who was the enemy? Does a riderless dragon no friend from foe, is the quote from the book. Mm -hmm. Um, Love that. But in the end, as it turns out, with everything, uh, everybody crashes again to the ground. This seems to be the way that most of these dragons die. Save Sea Smoke, I guess he got (laughs) kind of got uh, bit through, but... Yeah. um, and, And fell on Tessarian. So uh, Tessarian scratched up his wings, I think, and then uh, so he got somehow, yeah. They came, like, so Vermithor came in and, was, and started fighting Sea Smoke, and then Tessarian comes back and scra- and bites up Vermithor's wings. So it was just bizarre how, yeah, the fighting switched sides and and who fought whom um, between these dragons because, yeah, then Vermithor it doesn't really say he was wounded beyond 
and I'm also using the uh, art for reference here. And uh, it's just that he tried to take his prize into the air, uh, his prize being Sea Smoke's head, <laughs> three times and failed and died. Um, yeah. That's all it says. So. Um, yeah. Well, they, obviously, the, the the fall had hurt him to the point where that's true. <laughs> but he's yeah, so focused he on his get, prize, he couldn't get back up in the air. It wasn't. It wasn't just the weight of Sea Smoke's head or anything. <laughs> Too heavy, heart attack. Oh, oh, you know, nothing like that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the fall is actually what uh, you would cause list as the cause of death. Yes, <laughs> most likely. Or to Sarian, they had to like take him out of his misery. They Sent a bowman out to shoot him because he was suffering. So I guess. Yeah. So for for reference here, Tessarian, um is probably um like around like sixteen years old, um, and then Sea Smoke is around thirty six years old. So these were like fairly young dragons, especially Tessarian and um, Tessarian, my girl, the Blue Queen. I loved that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, Vermithor was actually said to be almost a hundred years old. Oh, could have been a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. and poor Silverwing. The way that, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. I. My goodness. This this was sad because it reminded me of the Game of Thrones finale. Also, Silverwing returns after all this has had Silverwing had fled. Um, later, singers would tell of how she thrice lifted Vermithor's wing with her nose as if to make him fly again. But this is most likely a fable. No, it's not. Drogon did the same thing to Danny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is 100% true in my head. <laughs> 100% true in my head. Singer's got it right, man. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Especially I mean, with those two being the, the dragons of the uh, old king, Al uh, Harris and Alisands. Yeah. Yeah. And how like Alisane to like for her dragon to just avoid the battle altogether and say, I'm having none of this. <laughs> This is not who we are. We are nobler. Mm. Yeah, and then she flies away. And I think it's just, I mean, the rest of her story is basically that she's on a, an island in the middle of Red Lake. And some people try to find her, but fail. And so then, yeah, it's, she's never mounted again. Mm -hmm. Almost as sad as a, of a, of a end of her story as Alisane to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of was, uh, went off on her own. I do want to circle back here to the death of Prince Darren, uh, because once again, we're forced to look at these different accountings, and I always say pick one or parts of one and parts of another, and you've probably got the truth, but I'll lay this out here, and you guys tell me what you think. Three conflicting accounts exist as to the manner of Prince Darren Targaryen. The best known claims that the prince stumbled from his pavilion with his night clothes afire only to be cut down by the Mirish sellsword Black Trombo, who smashed his face in with the swing of his spiked morning star. This version was the one preferred by Black Trombo, who told it far and yeah. wide. Sure. <laughs> the, <laughs> the second version is more or less the same, save that the prince was killed with a sword, not a morning star, and his slayer was not Black Trombo, but some unknown man at arms who, like as not, didn't even realize whom he had killed. Mm -hmm. In the third alternative, the brave boy known as Darren the Daring did not even make it out at all, but died when his burning pavilion collapsed upon him. That is the version preferred by Munkin's True Telling and by us. So we can eliminate that one immediately, right? <laughs> See, the problem with limiting that one immediately is that it makes me think that they use that one to cover up a more embarrassing one, which would be Black Trombo's one, which I have a hard time believing as well. <laughs> I do too. Uh, I prefer the second version. The rand a random, random, random soldier. Just a random dude. Yeah. Dude probably didn't even know that it was the prince he killed. Yeah. Uh, may even have been a mercy killing. The guy's on fire. Just take him out. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. I, I would buy that also because if, even if he was running out, uh, I would imagine if it's because his pavilion was on fire and all that, um, he probably wouldn't have stopped to put on armor or anything if he was just running to Tessarian to mount her to take you know part in the battle. He wouldn't have needed um, armor. He wouldn't be fighting on ground. He would just need to be get onto his dragon, you know? 
Mm-hmm. It's believable to me. <laughs> But yeah, I, I agree with you, Susan, from earlier. You said that he was he's like the the least worst of the greens. And I and I felt that <laughs> yeah. that this was how he died. <laughs> right. The least worst. That's, that's good. <laughs> and uh, I like also how they talked about the fact that there really wasn't a true uh, winner of the battle, that the king's men had to go back behind Tumblestone's Tumbleton's walls. And so they weren't able to be uh, the queen's men weren't able to stage a uh, siege um, or anything. So, but, but they did kind of feel that uh, uh, they'd gotten the upper hand because they had uh, killed a prince and two dragons and were able to make off with all of these supplies, wagons, fodder, and war horses. So I, I do think they certainly made out the better of, of the two sides. As for the remaining betrayer off the white, Kelly, here's another Arbor Gold. Hobart Hightower poisons off the white with, with Arbor Gold, but he has to poison himself in the process. Yeah, that was kind of, like, impressive, right? Like, <laughs> Well, you think about Maester Crescent was trying to do the same thing to Melisandre. That's very true. Yep, and we had uh, the, the options were a Dornish Red or an Arbor Gold, and I think this is a... a kind of implied that the um, Arbor Gold is sweeter, so it's easier to hide poison in. Um, so that was why it was suspicious or something like that. that, that and so he was, uh, he did end up poisoning himself. And, and I don't know, at that point, I feel like, you know, the, uh, this, this guy wasn't known to be a fighter. I don't know why he went on with this. Um, but yeah, he uh, went ahead and, and sipped the, the poisoned wine. <laughs> I think what, what it was saying was that Ulf the White preferred sweeter wines, so he thought he would drink the the gold because it was sweeter. Mm-hmm. And he was he would plan to drink the other guy had planned to drink the red, but then because he was acting so suspicious, Ulf was like, "Oh, we'll put this aside and we'll both drink the same wine and leave it to yeah. a high tower to not have a poker face, right?" <laughs> That poor guy, yeah. It, or to be either too rigid or, I don't know, not uh, um, enough of a fighter to just do the deed, man. Like, at that point, you're you're found out. Like, <laughs> this guy's off the sot, not off the warrior. I don't know. It's, it's a clever story, but it, I have questions. I've got questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes, for, it makes for a heroic tale, right? If he chooses to poison himself. Yeah, it's very him, very right? noble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, rather than rather than just committing murder. Yeah, yeah, and if he wasn't, if, you know, maybe he wasn't uh, much of a warrior, but at least he was uh, brave in doing this because he knew that uh, he had to get rid of this guy. He was willing to stand up and do that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And he didn't. Uh, I guess he didn't want to betray his fellow cal cal. What is it? Caltrops. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then no one's able to success. Like a few of them try to mount Silverwing, and that doesn't go well. And uh, so she flies off to Red Lake. Yeah, and uh, Matt, we do have. He's not a Targaryen, but he was fighting with the Blacks. Uh, the recovery of Adam's body, um, mm. and taken back by his brother Alan to Driftmark, and he's got a tomb where it's engraved the one word, and it says "loyal." Loved it. Mm. <laughs> that was That's good. That's for. That's very good. This was the chapter where the my Blacks theory falls apart. <laughs> but he's not a Targaryen, I guess. Well, he's not know. a Targaryen, but uh, Joffrey had Targaryen blood. Right, that's the true. Same as Gisera, the same as Gisaris and the same as, as Lucerus. So we can now safely say that the Targaryen line that fought for the Blacks probably did not have Obi-Wan abilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, there was we've got one on and one yeah, the drag they both had fell from dragons uh over land. So maybe we could say that they um Oh, it's the water thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so it's sharks or fish. Okay. <laughs> I like how the uh the kid from Raven Tree Hall also took uh Adam's bones back to his place for a while until Alan was able to to retrieve them. Oh yeah, yeah. To Black Tree. Uh, I'm sorry, Raven Tree Hall. That's right. The Black Ben Blackwood. He he keeps popping yeah. up. This kid. Yeah. Well, bloody <laughs> yeah. Ben. 
Yeah. Bloody bloody Ben. He was at the uh, the land the God's Eye or no not the God's Eye but the yeah he was at Fish Feed yes that one <laughs> and uh, he wept at Fish Feed that's right we we're told he's just a kid that gave him the taste for blood always after that I suppose yeah so we get to uh, closing up at the end of this chapter here kind of we have Rhaenyra going knocking door to door yeah. very welcome at dusk and Dale. Um, can't get help in time from the area or Winterfell. Comes home to to Dragonstone, where surprise, surprise, <laughs> look who's there? I'll tell you what. I was much I was much happier to see that Sunfire had made it than I was to see that Aegon the Second had made it. Agreed. <laughs> Very much. Uh, until you start reading his description. And then you wonder. Well, then it's it's horrific how the the suffering that Sunfire went through. We hand waved a little bit of Rhaenyra's journey, but she did have to stop at at uh, Duskendale, where it was both the towns that she had uh, passed over the ladies for their younger brothers <laughs> that we had talked about. Yeah, um, and so Ross she kind of gets Duskendale. Yeah, so she kind of gets come up and there a little bit that they're not very happy with her. <laughs> oh, now you need my help, do you? Madam exactly. <laughs> But yeah, and then she has to sell. She has to sell her crown. How hypocritical for her to want to mm. pass over the woman for the younger brother. Yeah, that was like the one time she compromised between uh, the sea snake and uh, Damon, right? <laughs> so, so wait a minute. She has to sell her crown. So that means that that was the old king's crown, right? Yeah. Jairus's crown. Yep. So where is it now? Do we know? I yeah, I couldn't tell. It said she sold it for coin. To get on a Bravosi ship to, to Dragonstone. So I don't know if that meant that she sold it to the Bravosi or if she sold it somewhere in Westeros. So it's very vague and I think intentionally so. It reminds you of uh, Viserys and uh, Daenerys in the Game yeah. of Thrones having to sell their mother's crown. Yeah, very much so. But yes, then at Dragonstone, she's betrayed, betrayed, betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, uh, evidently I I love how um it comes back to where the uh let me see here's the quote the full mushroom cruelly says that whereas most dragons move through the sky like eagles sunfire had become no more than a great golden fire breathing chicken hopping and fluttering from hill to hill yet this quote fire breathing chicken crossed over the waters of Blackwater Bay for it was sunfire that the sailors on Nesseria had seen attacking Grey Ghost. Sir Robert Quince had blamed the cannibal. But Tom Tangletongue, wow, what a name, a stammerer who heard more than he said, had piled the Valentines with, an, with ale, making note of all the times they mentioned this attacker's golden scales. The cannibal, as he knew well, was black as coal. So Sunfire had enough power in him, at least at one point, to take mm -hmm. on Grey Ghost. Yeah, and uh, Grey Ghost is supposedly, um, I think, older. Uh, these these wild dragons are older and bigger, so uh, Sunfire is not that old. Uh, very interesting how Sunfire was able to do that. Um, but yeah, enough strength at that time, but now freshly wounded. Not so strong. Um, but yeah, I think we, we kind of brushed over that uh, kind of mysterious little hint dropping that George did earlier in the book. <laughs> it was very clever. Yeah. And here, the cannibal, wherever he's at, I mean, he's got the name of cannibal because he used to eat the young dragons, right? He doesn't have very much of a diet of those left. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah, that's true. He's probably going to have to keep a, a more have to change his diet or uh, a mutton not diet. Make it. <laughs> Go vegan, yeah. go, a cannibal. <laughs> For sure. But um, yeah, and then that's in, in that story, we actually find out that um, Bela had started uh, flying this this dragon that she had, Moondancer, that she, we, um, through this whole story, like she keeps saying, like, I want to be with you, Jacaris, and I'll fly, even though she wasn't able to fly Moondancer yet. And you can see why, because once the, the story we, we read about, this this is not a big dragon. It's uh, the size of a war horse and, and weighed less. It's tiny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, so when they try to take over the uh, the castle, she, nimble and quick little thing, uh, escapes, gets to her dragon, mounts up, and uh, flies up. And I love that, again, this guy who thinks he's going to have a triumphant fly into uh, the, the yard on his dragon, uh, which seems a very elaborate, considering that this dragon is so wounded, has to now battle this little tiny gnat of a dragon <laughs> and this little girl. <laughs> And is like completely felled, I think, impressive imagery at this for the, these two uh, to battle. <laughs> as bad a shape as he was in already, and then he shatters one leg and breaks the other this fall. And yeah, and, and Bela had stayed on um, Moondancer the whole way down and didn't get off until like the, the dragon was in her death throes, it said. So I don't know what that says, if that's meaning that Bela was braver or, or more... Um, risk taker here but uh i mean it worked out better for her for sure but she also was injured had to go to the maester but the and 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 that and that begins that begins the long travails of her being uh threatened with uh physical harm Mm. (laughs) (laughs) yes she she does have like that axe uh over her neck for for the next few chapters here (laughs) right good grief (laughs) So Raina has got to be surprised, right? When she finds out the whole story about how Aegon took her own home from her and was waiting for her. Um, and Rhaenyra ends up being Sunfire food. One of, I, like a, almost kind of like a last meal for Sunfire in a way. Mm. Yeah, I thought this scene was super interesting because I think we got like all of the dialogue that happened. Um, I, I don't think she ever found out how her brother got there. It was just... Brother, uh, I had hoped you were dead. And he says, not not before you, you're the elder. And then she's like, you know, quip, quip, quip. And then without any other chance of escape or anything happening, he just feeds her to the dragon right away. And I was like, that's actually really smart. <laughs> like, Just to end this. If one of you is going to end it and has the upper hand, end it. And he did. Uh, it was super fast. <laughs> no monologuing. <laughs> Did you want monologuing or no. were you satisfied with that? I thought that was super, I thought that was ingenious. Like at this point, after everything they've all they've suffered, like just do it. Like you know, I wasn't happy that uh, that's you know nobody's a winner at this point. Everybody's a loser. But I thought I was glad that there was no monologuing. <laughs> One of George's greater hippie kind of points: nobody's a winner in a war. I think I a little bit more. I, I found it interesting. Um, the quote is that. Um, When she is about to, right before she dies, it says, uh, Sunfire, it is said, did not seem at first to take any interest in the offering until Broom pricked the queen's breast with his dagger. The smell of blood roused the dragon who sniffed at her grace, then bathed her in a blast of flame so suddenly that Sir Alfred's cloak caught fire as he leapt away. Rhaenyra Targaryen had time to raise her head toward the sky and shriek out one last curse upon her half-brother. Before Sunfire's jaws closed around her, tearing off her arm and shoulder. Like, I don't know what killed her here. <laughs> like, the, was it the fire? Did she got her arm and shoulder bitten off? And then she was uh, devoured in six bites, leaving her left leg for the stranger. Mm. So many interesting things about the way she died here. Did you guys catch anything that you wanted to t- talk about? <laughs> I just, again, the poor Aegon the Younger had to witness this again uh another probably one of the most horrendous uh things that he's had to witness yeah like if especially since there are dragons out there who are able to like you know a horse can ride down their gullet it is said you know um this is a smaller dragon so it took six bites to kill to, to devour her um i'm interested in the fact that uh It didn't seem interested in in eating her until there was blood. Okay, she's Targaryen. Maybe it's used to her scent or something. And then it hit hit her with dragon fire. But then she still had time to raise her head towards the sky and shriek out a curse, even though she was being bathed in flame. It's very interesting that I'm like, is there a little bit of um, fire resistance here? A little heat resistance in the uh, Targaryen blood that helped her survive this? I mean, he's a young dragon, but I still would think a... Dragon, a blast of dragon flame at point blank would uh, kind of stop any shriek or curse from uh, coming out of your mouth at that point. <laughs> well, even Varys in the show managed to not scream when, you know, of course, that flame was probably, he probably just vaporized. Um, but I, 
you know, the only other hint that we have of this in A Song of Ice and Fire really is Daenerys, right? And that wasn't dragon fire. That was the fire of... It was pyre fire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, so it's... I've always understood it. it's not... Um, it's the, a heat yeah. resistance. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's a heat resistance. <laughs> So I I just found this whole thing interesting on a reread that uh, she was heat resistant enough to withstand uh, the onslaught of dragon fire long enough to shriek a curse. Well, let's <laughs> let's not forget that Sunfire is not exactly you know true. Uh, he's he's a hopping chicken according yes. to Mushroom. So <laughs> maybe his fire is not as strong. Maybe his fire game's not quite as strong as it used to be. I, I will take that as as valid because yeah, that's that's very good explanation. <laughs> or you know, time delay. Maybe uh, he was across the yard far enough. The time you know, sound carries faster than fire. I don't know. I'm coming up with anything now. <laughs> and supposedly the most beautiful dragon that there was. Oh, I know. It's the tragedy of Sunfire. I thought was. I feel like. It, this would have to be how it would end for the most beautiful dragon ever in, to fly the skies of Westeros. Like, just Cripples, be- bastards, and broken things, people. It's perfectly in line with George's thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Before we move on to the next chapter, one thing I, I wanted to uh, bring up is when we had, last time that I had talked, uh, that I had been on the podcast with you, uh, Matt, I tried to bring reference to some historical people and again when you look at the war of the roses when you look at the dance of dragons and i think about these mothers who just lost so many children with uh, alice at hightower and renera targaryen so many of their uh especially their sons dying in battle as a result of this war and, and thinking about in retrospect as They get towards the end of this, how it must be affecting them. Are they thinking about, was this, you know, worth any of it? So that reminded me in the War of the Roses, you had uh, Cecily Neville, the Duchess of York. Her husband was the one uh, who kind of started the thing between the the Yorks and the Lancasters. So she lost her husband and she lost three of her four sons to war. Uh, One of them died when he was on the throne, and then she lost her two grandsons, or the two of the boys in the tower, so, uh, and she, you know, outlived all of those. So, just to think that later on in life, you have to be reflecting back on this. And then, um, her daughter-in-law, Elizabeth Woodville, who was the mother of the boys in the tower, she had also lost her father and several brothers and three of her sons. So it, those, to me, I just comparing Alison Hightower and Rhaenyra Targaryen as women who had to experience a tremendous amount of loss, all in the name of, of this, these uh, ongoing battles and trying to grapple for power. Love it. Good comparison. That is awesome. Susan, I always love your historical insight. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Any other last thoughts on this chapter before we move on? <sighs> Renera was 33 years old. That's so young for everything she's been through. Yeah, that that one's definitely not, it's, you know, it's not the years, it's the mileage. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. And, I mean, at this point, that's all the, the dragons and and death. The main part of the dance is over here, right? Mm-hmm. For the most part, the main part of the dance is over. Right. And that's where we're going to stop this time around. We will be back with chapter 18, the last of the Dying of the Dragon chapters, the short, sad reign of Aegon the Second, And then we will wrap it up with chapter 19, Aftermath, the Hour of the Wolf. That's coming up next time. In the meantime, if you want to talk to Susan, our A Song of Ice and Fire Siren from the East about this book or any A Song of Ice and Fire books or any number of books, actually, or even Star Wars. She's very much into Star Wars. You can find her at Black Eyed Lily on Twitter. And if you want to follow our A Song of Ice and Fire Siren from the West or talk to her about any of the A Song of Ice and Fire series, 
and she's into a bunch of different stuff too as well so uh just look her up at kelly underfoot k-e-l-l-y underfoot as for this podcast of course before the dragon pod that's the letter b the number four the dragon pod on twitter or you can send emails feel free to send emails with your feedback on any of these chapters or if you have differing opinions with our interpretations of these chapters feel free to voice those as well you can send emails to matt's audio blog at gmail.com that's m-a-t-t-s audio blog at gmail.com or you can just use the contact form which is at the website matt's audio blog.com m-a-t-t-s audio blog.com that's where you find everything for this podcast including ways to get to podcast apps and if you could take the time to leave us a review i'd love it if you would I want to give a special shout out to climb a wall that's climb a wall on the u.s itunes store for your review back on i believe it was like august 8th i just hadn't looked for reviews for a while but thank you very much for doing so and folks we'll be back on thursday take care Send tweets to the letter B, the number 4, the Dragon Pod, and send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com.